testimony. This is more back and forth, back and forth. This one is a little bit more charged. Uh, Lawson here has been denied the right to read his own testimony up front, his own, um, uh, he's already responding, such as what Reagan got to do, what um, Disney got to do. He's not, he's not allowed. So it starts off on a sour note to begin with. After they're done, we'll go through what he wanted to, the statement he wanted to read, and we'll pick it apart. Look at the language and consider possibly why the, uh, the committee did not want to allow Mr. Lawson to read the statement in the first place. Uh, playwright and screenwriter John Howard Lawson, the president and organizing force of the Screenwriters Guild and acknowledged leader of the Communist Party in Hollywood in the late 1930s, became the first unfriendly witness subpoenaed to testify before the House Committee on Un-American Activities on October 27, 1947. That would be 70, almost 71 years ago. This followed a week-long session during which numerous studio heads, stars, and others spoke at length about purported communist activity in the industry. During that first week, film critic and former screenwriter John Charles Moffat detailed law... Oh, that's right, you're Moffat. No, I am. Right, you're Moffat. I'm sorry, I keep on pointing to you. You're not. No, no you're Mr. <laughs> Stripling. Yeah, so Moffat's the one who sets him up. Um, when his turn came, Lawson attempted unsuccessfully to read a statement into the record warning that the investigation threatened basic American rights and liberties. That statement appears below following the testimonies of Moffat and Lawson. With nine other unfriendly witnesses, Lawson gambled that the committee would issue contempt citations for their refusal to answer questions about their political associations and beliefs, and that after a court case and appeal, the Supreme Court would rule that such questioning violated their First Amendment rights. Further HUAC interrogations would thus be stopped. In 1949, however, before the appeal reached the High Court, two liberal justices died. Dun, dun, dun. And the next year, the newly constituted court refused to hear their appeal. The ten were sent to prison as a result, and in 1951, HUAC continued its Hollywood probe. Right, we've got Mr. Stripling, Mr. Moffat, and the chair, man. Did you ever join any organizations while you were in Hollywood in connection with being a writer for the motion picture industry? Yes, sir, I did. In 1937, shocked by the conduct of the fascists in Spain, I joined an organization known as the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League. Both my wife and I became members of that organization. We contributed considerable sums of money for us to what we supposed was the buying of ambulances and medical supplies for the assistance of the loyalists in Spain. After we had been in that organization some months, we were in invited to what turned out to be more or less a star chamber meeting, an inner corpse meeting. It took place in the home of Mr. Frank Tuttle, a director. Mr. Herbert Biberman, who had been responsible for my being in the anti-Nazi league, was there, as was his wife, Miss Gail Sondergaard, an actress. Donald Ogden, Ogden Stewart was also one of those present. Would you give the committee an account of the activities that you observed as a member during those six weeks? Well, the most significant activity I observed came out in a conversation with Mr. John Howard Lawson. Did you identify Mr. Lawson? Yes, sir. He is a writer, is he not? John Howard Lawson is a writer. He was the first president of the Screenwriters Guild. It has been testified before the Tenney Committee of the California Legislature that Mr. Lawson was sent to Los Angeles by the Communist Party for the purpose of organizing communist activities in Hollywood. It was testified by a former secretary of the Communist Party for Los Angeles County. We will go back to your activities in the anti-Nazi League. During the period I referred to, the period between the time I discovered that this was a communist front organization and the period some six weeks later, there I resigned. When I resigned, I had several conversations with Mr. Biberman, Mr. Lawson, and others of that organization. During the course of it, Mr. Lawson made a significant statement. He said, as a writer, do not try to write an entire communist picture. He said the producers will quickly identify it and it will be killed by the front office. He said, as a writer, try to get five minutes of the communist doctrine. 
five minutes of the party line in every script that you write. He said, get that into an expensive scene, a scene involving expensive stars, large sets, or many extras, because, he said, then even, then even if it is discovered by the front office, the business manager of the unit, the very watchdog of the treasury, the very servant of capitalism, in order to keep the budget from going too high, will resist the elimination of that scene. If you can make the message come from the mouth of Gary Cooper or some other important star who is unaware of what he is saying, by the time it is discovered he is in New York and a great deal of expense will be involved to bring him back and reshoot the scene. If you get the message into a scene employing many extras, it will be very expensive to reshoot that scene because the number of extras involved or the amount of labor that would be necessary to light and reconstruct the large set. That was the nucleus of what he said at that time. I later heard another statement by Mr. Ross. That was made in the summer of 1941 when some young friends of mine who were attending what was purported to be a school for actors in Hollywood, I think it was on Labria Boulevard, asked me to go over and hear one of the lectures, introductions on act, instructions on acting. I went over on this night and Mr. Lawson was a lecturer. During the course of the evening, Mr. Lawson said this, and I think I quote it practically verbatim. Mr. Lawson said that to these young men and women who were training to, for a career of acting, he said, it is your duty to further the class struggle by your performance. He said, if you are nothing more than an extra wearing white flannels on a country club veranda, do your best to appear decadent. Do your best to appear to be a snob. Do your best to create class antagonism. He said, if you are an extra on a tenement street, do your best to look downtrodden. Do your best to look a victim of the existing society. That would be the end. For you, what has he just done? Set up Mr. Lawson. Hmm? Or took the focus off of himself. And? And put it on Mr. Lawson. And put it on Mr. So he's implicated Lawson. He's backing up some uh, earlier testimony. Right? Yeah, 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 I joined. Yeah, I joined. Uh, I went that, yeah, just because of the things that were happening in Spain. This guy, and what words, what two words were used again and again? He said. He said. He said. He said. He said. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, Mr. John Howard Laws, if you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but truth, so help you, God. Sure. Okay. sentence in your statement. That statement is not pertinent to the inquiry. Now this is a congressional committee, a congressional committee set up by law. We must have orderly procedure and we are going to have orderly procedure. Mr. Stripling, identify the witness. The rights of American citizens are important in this room here and I intend to stand up for those rights. Rights, congressman, congressman Thomas. Mr. Lawson, Will you state your full name, please? I wish to protest against the unwillingness of this committee to read a statement. When you permitted Mr. Warner, Mr. Mayor, and others to read this to 
read statements in this room. My name is John Howard Lawson. What is your occupation, Mr. Lawson? I am a writer. How long have you been a writer? All my life, at least 35 years, my adult life. Are you a member of the Screenwriters Guild? The raising of any question here in regard to membership, political beliefs, or affiliation, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, is absolutely beyond the powers of this committee. Mr. Chairman. But. Keep it going. Fast, fast, fast. It is fast. a matter of public record that I am a member of the Screenwriters Guild. I ask. I you guys. I want to caution the people in the audience. You are the guests of this committee, and you will have to maintain order at all times. I do not care for any applause or any demonstrations of one kind or another. Now, Mr. Chairman, I am also going to request that you instruct the witness to be responsive to the questions. I think the witness will be more responsive to the questions. Mr. Chairman, you permitted. <laughs> Never mind. Witness, witnesses in this room to make answers of three or four or five hundred words to question here. Mr. Lawson, you will please be responsive to these questions and not continue to try to disrupt these hearings. I am not on trial here, Mr. Chairman. The, this committee is on trial here before the American people. Let us get that straight. We don't want you to be on trial. Mr. Lawson, how long have you been a member of the Screenwriters Guild? Since it was founded in its present form in 1933. Have you ever held any office in the Guild? The question of whether I have held office is also a question which is beyond the purview of this committee. It is an invasion of the right of association under the Bill of Rights of this country. Please be responsive to the question. It is also a matter of public record. You, you asked to be heard. Through your attorney, you asked to be heard, and we want you to be heard. And if you don't care to be heard, then we will excuse you, and we will put, your, we will put the record in without your answers. I wish to frame my own answers to your questions, Mr. Chairman, and I intend to do so. It's absolutely beyond the power of this committee to inquire. Wait, did I read that? Did I? No. Okay. It is absolutely beyond the power of this committee to inquire into my association in any organization. Mr. Lawson, you will have to stop or you will leave the witness stand. And you will leave the witness stand because you are in contempt. That is why you will leave the witness stand. And if you are just trying to force me to put you in contempt, you won't have to try much harder. You know what has happened to a lot of people that have been in contempt of this committee this year, don't you? I'm glad you you have made it perfectly clear that you are going to intimidate the witness, Mr. Chairman. I am an American, and I am not at all easy to intimidate. And don't think I am. Mr. Lawson, just quiet down again. The most pertinent question that we can ask is whether or not you have That would be, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lawson, the most pertinent question that we can ask is whether or not you have ever been a member of the Communist Party. Now, do you care to answer that question? You are using the old technique, which was used in Hitler Germany in order to create a scare here. Oh? In order to create an entirely false atmosphere in, in which this hearing is conducted. Excuse the witness. As they do, as they do from what I have written. Stand away from the stand. I have written Americanism for years, and I shall continue to fight for the Bill of Rights, which you are trying to destroy. Officers, take this man away from the stand. And everybody applauds. <laughs> there will be no demonstrations. No demonstrations for or against everyone will be. Everyone will be defeated. Okay. Good. So what's going on, guys? He wants to um, read his statement, but the chairman or the chairman didn't read it because it wasn't pertinent. Or <coughs> so he determines. Everybody will have the opportunity to see what the first line is. What else is going on? starts giving the answer they don't want to hear? They say that's not what we asked you. Right. Yes. Yeah. What's that? He has to answer the question. Right. 
fully. You know, when you start asking, when you ask a question about a, a person's organization and where they fit in an organization, if they choose not to, then they don't have to. You know, you can't implicate yourself. And what amendment is that? It is the fifth. Yeah. Give the yeah freedom of speech. Yeah, and also not to speak, and that's backed up by the Fifth Amendment, which is to incriminate yourself. I plead the fifth. Yeah. My grandmother says that all the time. I plead the fifth. Yeah, I plead the fifth. Yeah. Right. Uh, as far as the gavel, you know, using the gavel, you, know, you find yourself in a room and you got this guy banging away, banging away, and he warns him about the whole contempt thing. You can see what he's trying to do, right? He's trying to elevate it. Get it outside these walls, get it outside those doors. Let's get it to the Supreme Court. Let's get it to the nine justices who can then decide, you know, am I protected? Are the Bill of Rights still alive in America? His plan was just fine until those two judges died. <laughs> yeah, that changes everything. Something similar is going on in America. You, know, you had a, one of the justices die, and they would not allow the sitting president to uh, select a candidate for nine months. Over nine months. They didn't allow that to happen. And the president was elected, and they said, go ahead. Yeah. It's justice, yeah. That's that's one branch of the government people really don't pay enough attention to. Okay, what else? <coughs> Anything? Yeah. <coughs> oh, the boys? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they all could. They all could. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing, Lawson, Lawson's beside himself. Lawson is like ready and gearing up for a nice, nice little tussle. Come on, let's go. I know where I'm taking this. And you, you, we're going to read his statement. You guys ready? Yeah. Let's read what, what Lawson had to say. Is that okay, Ms. Holly? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to do the first uh, paragraph together. And then as you're reading, you guys have yours? It will be no question in your mind as to why.